your trusted source for information on the energy transition. This is the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Welcome to another edition of the Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me today is Connor Hogan, the co-founder of One Planet Recycling. Connor, welcome to the program today. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. So we're talking recycling, but this is an energy podcast. Um, you guys do some pretty unique recycling. What is it that your plant, your company has started out to do? Yeah, so um, our company is exclusively focused on recycling solar modules. Um, I got here from the energy world, um, saw the need for it a couple of years ago, probably actually back in 2018, if I could date it, um, started to see the need for this from the energy world. And more or less came to the conclusion that there really wasn't a good solution. Um, fast forward to post IRA implementation and a lot of credits and, uh, and you know, just general grant funding opportunities started to pop up. So pulled the trigger um, to jump into the space with three other co-founders, one from the renewable energy space as well, and then two others from the steel manufacturing and metals recycling world. Now, when we've talked in the past, you, you've mentioned the importance of the background of your co-founders. You, you've said that, hey, you know, if I just came at that just with an energy background or not a non-recycling background, um, I might not be successful. Help me understand a little bit of how their backgrounds are helping your company and, and the kind of impact that makes. Yeah, sure. So uh, to get here, I'll unpack really quickly um, or to get there, I'll unpack really quickly how I wound up in this spot. So at Goldman, to go back to that 2018 story, um, at Goldman, I started to see a, a real need for this. Um, there was one project specifically in Southern California where we ran into um, a lot of pushback from the permitting uh, zoning uh, perspective, and it all kind of centered around the assumptions surrounding the decommissioning bond for the project, um, which, you know, dovetails very neatly into a discussion around recycling. So um, kind of went down the rabbit hole uh, from a technical diligence or due diligence background, um, went a little bit more deep into it than I probably would have liked to, but it's ultimately what kind of sparked the passion for this because I came to the conclusion, like I said, there wasn't really a good solution. Um, Left Goldman, started up at a, actually a, a climate tech software company called Euclid. Um, they're kind of a consulting firm that has a, a, a business to business uh, SaaS type, type element to them. Uh, same story, saw, saw the need for this um, popping up even more so in the 2020, you know, post COVID kind of, a, kind of a time frame up until about a year ago. And so, uh, going back to the discussion around IRA, saw a lot of the credits and grants coming out of the IRA and, and more or less came to the conclusion, hey, this is, you know, it's one of those moments in time where if I don't go do it, I'm probably going to kick myself, you know, 10 years down the line when I watch somebody else do it. So um, reached out to um, a couple different co-founder or the, the co-founders in the recycling world and steel world. And really the the point for me or to go back to your to your question was. You know, I know a lot about solar. Um, I could talk to you about solar for probably the entire podcast, but what I didn't know a lot about was recycling. And when I spoke to the two co-founders from the recycling world and the steel manufacturing world, it kind of shed a lot of light on the economics of the business um, and really kind of changed my perception of the, the growth for this business. So, it, 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 you know, I think really what you start to realize is that um, it's hard to replicate experience. And so the beauty of our team is that under one umbrella, we have a wealth of a wealth of exp experience and expertise in both renewable energy asset management so we can you know speak that language as well as the steel recycle steel manufacturing recycling world where you know we have a, a large network of of potential buyers um, a lot of history around plant commissioning and startup for for these types of activities specifically metals recycling so um, with that you know we, I think we have a, a pretty significant competitive advantage um, and that I think kind of gets translated uh, to our customers in the form of um, industry leading pricing and, and a couple other bespoke services that um, are really unique for developers and IPTs. Okay. So let's slow roll back into this from the beginning. You said that the IRA and some of the advantages from your financial background caught your attention. What specifically caught your attention? Where, how, how is starting a solar recycling company today aligning to some of the IRA and some of the programs out there? 
Yeah. So the, the big light bulb for me was the 48C um, investment tax credits. Um, they were extended with the IRA. They were, they were extended to include recyclers of advanced energy equipment. So if you're a recycler that, um, you know, takes in solar panels, wind panels, et cetera, the credits were provisioned for, for those types of projects. And so when that got passed, they just closed round one or they, they announced round, round one awardees um, not too long ago. When the credits were announced, that was really the big light bulb moment for me because it started to look a lot more like a solar project in the sense that you have you know a investment tax credit, um, there's a sponsor equity type, type, of, a, type of a financing structure. And so that was really attractive. Um, and, and that I think was if I could, you know, tie it off to one element of the IRA, that, that's probably the big driver for me personally that kind of piqued interest was the, the specifically 48C. There's also 45X, which is a PTC or a production tax credit um, that I think fits a little bit. It kind of fits a, another business model, not ours necessarily. But um, those two are the big drivers for me. I think that that kind of, you know, pushed the interest over into into this world. Does the business model sustain itself without tax credits? I, I get a lot of people that, you know, either for or against tax credits um, for long term sustainability. Is this something that someone would do if there weren't tax credits? Is this just enough to put you over the edge or is it really fundamental to the, the functioning of these kind of businesses? Yeah, good question. It's hard to say right now at this juncture, right, because the economics are still unfolding. I think um, that's one of the that's one of the challenges right now for us is, is, you know, understanding the unit economics in a space that's rapidly evolving. So you have on one side te a technology that's extremely immature. It's in its infancy stages. And, and you know, the, the idea is over the next decade, similar to kind of the solar growth curve, we'll see this technology rapidly develop and expand and mature um, and our I, I guess our internal estimation is probably by the mid 2030s this will be a pretty well established technological process um, or you know process of technology so to speak the tax credits I think you know I think the in, in, again my opinion here I think that they're they're going to serve a huge role in incentivizing the investment at this stage which otherwise is left ambiguous to a lot of investors because of the fact that the unit economics are still, you know, evolving. So I think that the credits are going to go a long way to kind of incentivize that capital deployment today versus, you know, five years from now where it might be a little bit too late where we kind of, you know, this, the problem has eclipsed the, uh, the, the capacity. And so I think um, to your point, I think that there's a case to be made in the absence of credits, this would still be a viable business. Definitely. I think that the trade-off would be you may not have the same level of, of investment interest today as you otherwise would a couple of years in the future, That if that's a good answer to that. I, I think it's, it's, it's your answer to give. Um, I guess the, the question I would have, 2030, you use the words today, are we too soon? I mean, the solar industry is still pretty, it's been around, but the, the kind of growth and deployment we're seeing, is the time now to start recycling panels and is there enough demand to support this kind of industry. I think you've mentioned there's two or three solar recyclers that specialize in this today. Um, what kind of demand is in the market? What's the need? Yeah, so um, I think to start off, maybe we dissect where we get panels from or what, what, the, what are the, uh, the loss events, so to speak, for, for to size the market. So there's four areas that, that we see module losses originate from. So to start at the very beginning, um, manufacturers, if, you, if you're a manufacturer of solar panels, you're going to have some type of QA, QC loss um, or, you know, manufacturing yield. So we see from the very earliest stages, um, manufacturers will generate some small percentage of their total production in the form of uh, defective modules. So those modules would be obviously, you know, eligible for recycling. So if you were to take the entire, you know, U.S. based manufacturing capacity and apply some some loss factors there, hypothetical loss factors. That's one source of panels. The next source so of panels. Let me stop you there. So, curious, so, yeah. so where is the U.S. capacity at? Geography, where, where would I find most manufacturing of, of solar panels in the continent yeah. of the U.S.? Yeah, so there's going to be a lot on the West Coast. Um, there's been a big push to have a lot of manufacturers actually in the Southeast. So I think you've seen it with you know Q-Cells, Q Heline, and a couple others. 
Um, First Solar is really active in, in Ohio as well um, as Alabama. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's pretty well evenly dispersed, I'd say, between, I guess, the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, the, the key distinction, though, is the type of module. So obviously, First Solar produces a thin film module versus other manufacturers are producing either bifacial or monofacial modules. Um, if you're at a segment in, in terms of that, you may see a little bit of a, of a tilt for where the uh, the the silicon uh, crystal and silicon modules are being are being produced, but I'd say ultimately it's a pretty even split between east west coast. Um, okay. For for cool, I just curious. Is. All right, so that, that's one component. Yeah. So you, you've got the, the the production manufacturers; they have some defects or whatever that would go to recycling. Yep. Then you're also going to have construction losses. So when a plant um, is built, the kind of rule of thumb is that the average losses during construction are going to be around half a percent. Um, that could be plus or minus based on the based on really the EPC contractor. You have some EPCs who have substantially higher and lower, just kind of based on on you know processes and. And protocols that play in place with those EPCs. So you'll have a range of, uh, of construction losses. Um, just assume, you know, for baseline purposes, assume half a percent. Um, so you could take the total projected installed capacity, or you know, the, the total projected installed capacity in a year, and then assume half a percent of that is going to be generated in losses. The third rung would be operating losses. So when a facility is COD'd and you have a 30 year life or a 30 year you know, underwrite for that asset, you're gonna have a loss profile that kind of ticks up with that, with that project as time goes on. So you may have really low losses at the beginning of the project's life kind of to be expected. And then as time goes on, that loss number kind of starts to creep up. So you could, I think NREL has really good data on this as well, but the number that they published, I, I believe, was around a quarter of a percent to a half a percent in the first five years per year. Um, and then years five through 15, that kind of ticks up into the one percent range. And then 15 plus, you start looking at two percent. And the sources for that could be, you know, um, torque tubes, uh, bending modules. You could have uh, micro cracking. I think that's been a big issue with the industry, even since I was back at Goldman. Hail damage has kind of been the, uh, the the new one that I think you've seen a lot coming out of the insurance uh, insurance world and a lot of the, the problems that they're having with renewable energy property insurance. Um, and then just, you know, nat, nat cat, so hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, et cetera, all of that stacks up to about anywhere from half a percent to 2% throughout the asset's lifetime, given, you know, depending upon where it's at from COD. And then the fourth and the, the soon to be biggest is going to be repowering and decommissioning. And so if you were to look at the, uh, the solar uh, growth curve, the way to kind of pr approximate this is the useful life for these assets is, say, 25, 25, 30 years. And so if you have an asset that was built in 2000, um, it's, come, it's one year off from being at, at you know, the end of, its, end of its life. And so there's a lot to unpack here because from the owner operator world, there's this unique calculus that goes on to kind of determine whether or not an asset is attractive for repower or if they want to go ahead and kind of wind down, wind down operations and decommission the plant. And it's kind of a, a trade off between the, the real estate value that the asset's sitting on and then, the, and then power market pricing and then, you know, your standard CapEx type. Type, type determinants. Um, and so ultimately owners are, are left with a decision that they have to make, whether or not they repower and decommission. And ultimately 100% of the panels at that point in time would obviously have to be recycled. And so we kind of think that our, our position is that a lot of the assets that were built in 2010, they have much lower module wattages. So back, you know, back then I think it'd be like 275 would, would have been a pretty, you know, premier utility scale panel compared to today's 450, 550 plus type, type, you know, bifacial uh, panels. So there's a huge technology gap between those panels for, you know, of, of yesterday versus today. And so we have an assumption that a lot of those assets that would otherwise be repowered at 25 years may get repowered you know, slightly earlier than that at the 20 year mark, because theoretically they could essentially swap panels out and double nameplate capacity. Um, and so we think that there's going to be kind of a shift in the beginning where the, a lot of those assets are repowered probably earlier than they were underwritten for. And then as time goes on, you know, I think you'll see the technology, the technology growth curve for solar start, start to level out. And then that'll 
probably look more like a traditional 30 year useful life where you'd have those assets repowered or decommed. But those are the four key areas. And to go back to your original question, just from the manufacturing losses, operating losses and construction losses, um, there's there are gigawatts worth of, of solar that are that are that are being generated that are eligible for recycling. And then to that point, the percentage of that that actually is being collected or recycled is right now pretty low. It's uh, probably, you know, single or, or maybe now double digit percentages. Um, I, I, I'd probably err on the side of single digit percentages are actually being recycled. Largely in part due to cost, pro due to the cost prohibitive nature of, of the of the service. So you know that's I think one of the things that we're shooting to have is a, a significant decline in, in the in the in the cost of, of recycling. But for now, that's kind of where um, that's kind of where the industry is at. And I think that you should probably consider it even at this stage because if you're a developer, there's a lot of benefits to to having that proactive stance when it, when it comes time to go to the community planning boards and zoning boards, etc. All right, so. Through this conversation, um, I think we've been making an assumption that I want to clarify because I think there's danger. Use the word recycle. Yep. And we all think we know what recycle means. Help me get a definition from your perspective of what it means to recycle a solar panel. What percentage of that is going back? What materials am I getting out of a solar panel? And how does that differ for different types of panels and different technologies. You've just already in your description so far, you've described the evolution of panels and where they're going, whether it's a bifacial, whether, you know, whatever the technology is. What does recycle mean? Help me baseline that. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. One well, we get a lot as well. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's extremely important. So we'll start with just where the, the market's at. 80% of the market is monofacial uh, crystal and silicon panels. Um, the remainder of that 20% is overwhelmingly bifacial uh, uh, crystal and silicon panels. And then in the last portion, small, the smallest por portion is, is um, thin film. Now, they expect thin film to grow as time goes on. But in, today's state, in, in the state of today's market, it's overwhelmingly monofacial um, crystal and silicon panels. So we're gonna, I'm going to start and focus there because that's 80% of the market. Those panels, just using... You know, baseline averages provided by NREL, um, it's it's rough. It's overwhelmingly glass. About three quarters of the panel is, is glass. So 75 percent of the panel's weight is in the form of glass. Um, uh, about seven to nine percent is in the form of aluminum. Um, six to seven percent is in the form of plastic. And then another, I think it's like six to eight percent or so is in the form of silicon. Um, the remaining is um, the remaining percentage, which I believe is in there is around 2% is a mixed metal stream, which is 98% copper um, and then 1% silver. And then the other 1% is tin and, and, other, and a couple other different um, smaller quantity metals. Um, so that's the, that's the material composition. So, and that's, that's great to understand to your question though, where does that all go? So when the panel reaches our facility, it's for, it goes through a series of, of steps that disassembles or, or you know, um, reduces the, the panel to, to those specific commodities or components. So the glass is ground off um, and the glass then is separated and sorted based on uh, the quality of the glass. Um, the aluminum is pulled off of the module. Um, the J-Box and the MC4 connectors are also stripped from the module and they all go into their respective bins. The silicon and the plastics and the copper are also um, collected and sorted at the end of the line. And so you end up with bags, essentially, for, to simplify the, this, uh, the, the process, you end up with bags of each of these different commodities. And so then the idea is to go back to the point about price. Ultimately, our goal is to have every module recycled. And so to get there, you need to create a compelling economic picture that is, you know, ideally as close to the cost of landfilling as possible, because that makes the, the choice or decision for everybody very, very simple, right? If it's a penny more to recycle than a landfill, it's a pretty, it's a, you know, it's a pretty easy decision compared to a $10 per panel difference between recycling and landfilling. And that's just, that's just the reality of, of the world, right? Economics kind of trump most decisions. And so, um, our goal is to get that that price that delivered that delivered price as close as we can to a landfill. And so the idea is, 
if we're not charging that price through to a customer, well, we have to make up for it on the back end for commodity sales. So the idea is those commodities should be sold to the highest buyer, the highest we should, our goal is to get the highest price per commodity so that that way we can then, you know, provide a, the lowest cost service to a utility or to an IPP or, or whoever may need panels recycled. So the glass typically is going to go to a um, standard glass recycling buyer. So that's going to be bottling. Uh, glass bottling is a big buyer of recycled glass. Um, concrete cement is another one. Um, we've also seen um, a couple different opportunities with sandblasting and, and some other some other different vendors that I, I, I won't go into detail for proprietary reasons. But glass being a big portion of, of our outputs is, is a really key you know commodity to, to, to market. Um, outside of that, aluminum goes back into the aluminum. So, and the glass, how the commodity market for glass, how volatile is that? It's actually not really that volatile from our experience so far. And I'm, I'm probably not the best person to give an answer for it. It'd probably be better to have one of the co-founders from, from the, the metals and recycling world talk to that. But I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lo it's an extremely large, um, market, uh, and, and glass, I think the trouble with, with glass, with recycled glass is that it's pretty cheap to make glass. Um, from virgin materials. And so I think to your point about tax credits, one of the things that would be really helpful is to have incentivize manufacturers to use more recycled uh, content. I think that that would be a, you know, a, a great thing for, for our industry at least. And I know that there's been some, um, some headway to try and do that, but the glass market is, is, is substantially large, large enough for us to be able to have, to, to have all of our inventory sold every year um, and, and not really right, be too big of a drop in the bucket. Yeah. All right. Sorry yeah. to derail you. Go go back. You were breaking down the the components. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So then the next um, next bucket of commodities would be the J box and MC four connectors. Those are going to go to a standard recycling yard where the wires would be stripped and the J boxes would go to an e waste recycler. So then they further process those those two materials. Um, the aluminum would go to a refiner or, or a smelter who's gonna take that aluminum extrusion, melt it back down. It could go into a Coke can, it could go into your automobile. Um, again, very liquid uh, market for, for, for secondary aluminum. Um, the copper and the uh, mixed metals are gonna go again to a refiner, a copper refinery. Um, the Silicon is going to go probably to the steel industry. Um, and that's an interesting kind of an interesting growth vector because it's kind of one of the things that we want to focus on is potentially, um, you know, working with some US based polysilicon manufacturers to try and, you know, ultimately have that silicon go back into the polysilicon uh, market. Um, but for right now, we've had we've had a lot of interest from buyers in the steel world as well for that silicon. Um, and then outside of that, um, the plastics are going to go to a plastics recycler. Um, and we have a really cool um, buyer that's in the court right now that I can't speak to, but it's going to ultimately go back into a consumer item um, that will hopefully be publicizing in a year from now. So that's that's kind of where, where like, these materials go. It doesn't sound like any of this is going into making new solar panels. So it doesn't seem like it's a life cycle where y you go build this. And then it goes back into a new solar panel. And arbitrarily, some of those elements may end up back, but it doesn't seem like that that's the, the current design. Is that true? So we're working with some major solar manufacturers to try and achieve specifically that, because that's ultimately the, the end goal, right, is to be able to say that, you know, a solar panel is 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 recycled back into a solar panel. The problem with that, though, is that it's 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 a lot harder done in practice than it is in, in you know, in, in, in thought or theory. And so... You have to think again, you know, what's what's the trade off? Would you rather be able to say that a solar panel goes back into a solar panel, but it costs you thirty dollars a panel to do it? Or would you rather say that the solar panel didn't go to a landfill and it cost you three dollars to do it and it still went into a variety of different industries? And right now, I think the latter is probably the better place to start because that's the less capital intensive objective to achieve. And then once you've achieved that, the idea would be that you can you can probably tackle the former uh, with a lot less headway or, or, or capital intensity to make that a reality. So our goal is to start off with delivering the, the lowest cost to users, because ultimately, like I said, our goal is to ensure that as many panels as possible don't wind up in a landfill, period. And then I, I guess as we kind of come up to time, I, the one question I wonder is, what would keep this from happening? What 
what hurdles are still in the industry to keep, um, you, you, know, you said we're in single digits of recycling. So how, to, what would keep us from getting to 70, 80, 90% recycling rates? It's, it's cost in a nutshell. It, it's, it's really and simply, I think it's cost. I, I think that there, there are, you know, there's two sides to the cost equation. So there's one, which is the, the fee, the physical fee that, you know, a company such as ourselves um, would, would charge a customer. Um, that's one side of the equation. The second side of the equation is that customer, like you just said, has to get those panels to our facility. Um, and so a lot of times, like, you know, if I, if we have a project where the, the bid is $10 a panel, just ballpark number, very easy. If, if the, if the tipping fee is $10 a panel, that same customer may have to spend it like 15 to $20 in shipping to get that panel to our facility. So on one side, the tipping fee, um, the, the, the structural roadblock there is the technology, right? Because the more efficient the technology is, the more that we ideally, the, the higher the purity of those commodities. And so we can market them for a higher, a higher price. And then on the flip side, the shipping is kind of a, a is, is a structural problem, right? Solar is a, a very distributed uh, resource or, a, you know, asset class. And so you have a lot of the, the large scale sites are, are, are way out there. They're, you know, 500 miles out from the, from, 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 from an urban area. So it's kind of shipping and the, and the tipping fee cost profile collectively, the all in cost to the, to the consumer. That's going to, I think, be the biggest barrier. We have a, a a solution for shipping that I can't speak to you right now, but our goal is to be able to cut the shipping costs by about 50% in the next five years. And, um, and same thing with the tipping fees. Our goal is to be sub $10 a panel all in uh, by, by 2030. All right. I, I do have to ask one more question because I, I, you know, the implication or the, what I understand from the way you're talking is that this is, this technology can only be used for solar panel. Is there something special in the way that you recycle this? So that means that these plants are only capable of doing solar panel recycling. Is that why we're shipping them 500 miles because the technology somehow is unique to recycling a solar panel? Yeah, that's correct. So if you were to send these to a normal, you know, a scrap yard, which there's, there's, a, there, I'm sure there's a scrap yard within every hundred miles of, of a solar, of a solar farm in the United States, the scrap yards can't, aren't outfitted to process this. They use it, to, they, they have their own, they have several types of technologies to process everything from automobiles to, you know, construction debris, et cetera. They don't have this technology in house and the, the capital cost to, to place this technology is substantial. And so, you end up with, you know, f fully outfitted or, or facilities fully outfitted, purpose outfitted or purpose built for solar panels. And so that's why there's there's such a, a, a distance uh, involved with with the shipping is because the facilities have to be purpose built for solar panels. And to your point, yes, they're, 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 the way that we construct our facilities is to exclusively process panels. Um, over the long haul, we'll probably add on some other technology to be able to process wiring and a lot of the balance of plant type stuff that when you de when you decom and repower is is kind of going to come with the panels, and so it makes it easier to, as a solution provider to, to to give those clients a one stop shop kind of a solution. But for the time being, the the facilities are are purely outfitted for for the recycling of solar panels. Well, Connor, this has been an amazing conversation. More than I expected to find out about solar panel recycling and that it's coming along. I want to thank you so much for being a guest in Insider's Guide today. Yeah, Chris, really appreciate the opportunity. We're glad to talk about it. And, you know, thank you to you and the podcast for, for having us on. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I did making it. Please take a second, give us a like or a comment. That really helps. And follow us and subscribe to us on YouTube. We'll see you again next time on the Insider's Guide to Energy podcast. Bye for now.